In the previous lessons, I introduced the basic I.O. model and we looked a little bit at how to analyze algorithms in this model. In this lesson, I want to talk more about two different types of I.O. efficient algorithms, so-called cache-aware algorithms and cache-oblivious algorithms. But before I start talking about that, let me briefly uh, go back to the model that we're looking at. So the I.O. model has an external memory, it has an internal memory, and it has a CPU. And if the CPU wants to do any computation of data, it has to be present in the internal memory. So if at some point the data is not in the internal memory but in the external memory, you first have to read it into the internal memory. And this reading of data, and that's the crucial aspect, is done uh, block by block. So if you ask for one particular data element, then actually what you're getting is a whole block containing many elements. Okay, the important parameters of the model are then, well, first of all, the memory size, M, how many elements fit into your internal memory, and secondly, the size of one block, how many elements do you put together in one block. And with size here, I really mean the number of elements, and it's not measured in, in kilobytes, but in numbers or something like that. Okay, and one assumption that is often made is that the internal memory size is not too small. And in particular, a technical assumption that is often needed is that this memory size M is at least B squared. Okay, so this is the theorem theoretical model that we're using to analyze our algorithms. Okay, let's also quickly go back to the analysis of the algorithm for scanning over a two-dimensional array. Okay, and let's say we scan over the array row by row. Well, as we've seen, to analyze the I.O. behavior of this algorithm, it's important to know how the blocks are formed. So if uh, you want to achieve n divided by b I.O.s for this algorithm, well, then you need that the blocks are formed in row major order, as you see here. Because exactly the same algorithm would take many more IOs if the blocks would be formed in column major order, right? A column by column algorithm is bad if the uh, data is stored row by row, but if the data is stored column by column, then a row by row algorithm would be bad. So what we see if you do the analysis of an algorithm in the IO model, it depends not only on the particular algorithm, but it also depends on what is called the blocking strategy, which data is put together in the block. It also depends, and we will be looking at that in more detail later on, at the replacement policy. Right? Because remember, as soon as you want to read a new block, but your internal memory is full, well, then before you can read the block, you need to write back one of your existing blocks from internal memory back to the external memory to make place to make room for this new block. And the number of IOs is going to depend on which block you write back. Right? If you're unlucky, you write back a block that you will need very soon, and then that would take you an, another IO. Whereas maybe if you wrote back a different block that you won't be needing at all anymore, then that would be much better. Okay, so uh, these are two important aspects. And one important observation is that which elements are put together in one block, so the blocking strategy, and also which block is written back to the external memory to make room for a new block, the replacement policy, these in principle can be controlled by your algorithm. Right? And whether or not this is being controlled, that's exactly the difference between the two types of algorithms that we're now going to look at. So what are these two types? Well, first of all, we have what are called the cache-aware algorithms. Okay, so here for cache, you could also read internal memory. So these algorithms, they are aware of, well, first of all, the size of the internal memory, and secondly, the block size. Okay, so they know the block size B and they know the internal memory size M and they somehow use that in the algorithm by saying something like, okay, put these elements together in one block, 
and put these other elements together in one block. And to be able to say that, well, you need to know how big a block is. Okay, so cache aware algorithms have this knowledge and they use it. Also, as I just explained, they can actually control the blocking policy and the replacement policy. So they can control, they can say, I want these elements together in one block. And they can say, well, if I want to read a new block, and if I will have to evict an existing block, then I want you to evict this particular block because I know that I'm not going to need it anymore for a long time. On the other hand, cache oblivious algorithms, they are oblivious of well, how big the internal memory is and they are oblivious of how big a block is, so they do not know this M and this B. Okay? Also, they cannot control the blocking policy and they cannot control the replacement policy. Okay? And the assumption when we do the analysis is, well, for instance, if we're working on an array or a uh, two-dimensional array, then maybe we assume beforehand that the array is stored, let's say, in row major order. But when you're writing data to disk, to the external memory, the assumption typically is that the order in which you write things to disk corresponds to the order in which the blocks are formed. So simply the first B items, the first B new items that you write back, okay, you don't know what B is, but the first B will be together in the block. Okay. The replacement policy, again, is something that cannot be controlled by the algorithm. Um, and the assumption is that the replacement policy is optimal. Okay, so this is an assumption when we will be analyzing a cache oblivious algorithm. And this assumption seems actually quite strong and unrealistic, but as we will see in some later lesson, it's actually not that unrealistic because in some sense, least recently used is, uh, gives a performance that is very close to the optimal performance. Okay? So it's very important to realize that uh, these cache oblivious algorithms, they're not only efficient if you think about the block transfers between external memory, say disks and internal memory, but because the block size M sorry, the block size B and the main memory size M are not used by the algorithm, it means that it's also efficient if you think about block transfers at other levels of the memory hierarchy. So if you think about how many blocks, these would be somewhat smaller blocks, are transferred between the internal memory and the level 3 cache, or maybe you're interested in the number of block transfers between the level 3 cache and the level 2 cache, also there the algorithm is automatically efficient. If it's cache oblivious and it does few IOs, then that holds at all the levels. And this is something that is not true for cache aware algorithms, because there, well, you actually set it up in such a way that it uses the fact that you can put a certain number of items, B, together in one block, but then if your B is different on a different level of the hierarchy, it doesn't work. So these cache oblivious algorithms have a lot of advantages. Something which is quite important to realize when you look at them is that the block size B and the memory size M, they're not used by the algorithm, but we will still be using them when we analyze the algorithm. Okay, so well, what did we see? Uh, we saw that these cache aware algorithms, well, they're more powerful, so sometimes you can get better results, but actually it's very inconvenient to have to control the blocking and to have to control the replacement policy, so it's much nicer to have a cache oblivious algorithm, it's much easier to implement, and it's actually going to be efficient at all the levels of the memory hierarchy. So that's quite nice. So in the upcoming lectures, we're going to see some examples of, well, cache aware and cache oblivious algorithms for the same problem. So actually for the so-called matrix transposition problem. And we're going to look a little bit more detail 
uh, in a little bit more detail into these replacement policies and I will prove that least recently used is pretty good, close to optimal. So the assumption that a cache oblivious algorithm has an optimal blocking, uh, optimal replacement policy is okay. And well, after that, we're going to look at a lot of different results, for instance, on sorting in the IO model. Thank <laughs> you.